And so, for example, Kirkland, which is like the Costco brand or whatever, is uh, USB certified. So if you get Kirkland brand, but it would be you know, you can absolutely be sure. Another thing you can do is just use two different brands. You might buy two different brands of B12 and like every other week. So I recommend you know, 2,000 micrograms once a week. It's probably the easiest way. And so like a bottle is going to last you like two years or whatever. So you can get two bottles and like every other week you switch bottles. Or just in case one screwed up. If you see my videos, you know there are studies like in the New England Journal of Medicine, the, the, the most prestigious medical journal on the planet Earth. And here's the title. Ready? Blindness in a vegan. How many animals did that article kill? Right? How many animals did that vegan kill by not taking their B12? And ending up blind, and we have that headline, and it, there were headlines all over the world. So even if you don't care about yourself, you're an animal too, then we need to make sure a regular reliable source of vitamin B12, critically important. So the new egg substitute just a yeah. made of mung beans. Yeah. Does that count nutritionally as beans or is it too processed? Um, so that is a, a mung bean protein isolate. So instead of like a soy protein isolate, like you know, TVP is just like soy protein. But, so it's like mung bean protein isolate. So that does not, unfortunately, count towards your bean intake. Uh, since what we love about beans are all the other things like the fiber and folate and potassium. It doesn't count, but of course, about an, inf an infinite time better than sure. Right. Okay. As far as like and sodium intake and all that, oh, yeah. and I do Bikram hot yoga and oh. also saunas yeah. and that kind of huh. thing. Does that counteract the sodium and yeah. what is yeah. heat and longevity? No, no, so, so, so you should be able to get all, there's no reason anyone, even athletes that sweat a lot, need to take um, supplemental salt or electrolyte solutions. You can get all your sodium from food, you can imagine. We made it for, you know, a couple tens of millions of years without salt shakers or salt mines or KFC. And we get all the salt we need from um, whole healthy plant foods and we should not go out of our way to eat salt instead. Hot dietary respect for death. It's not processed meat, it's not eggs, ah, it's sodium. So when you do these studies, so the SWAT meat study at Stanford, fantastic study, took, took people, randomized them to Beyond Meat um, uh, products versus, you know, organic pasture-raised, you know, you know, fancy, expensive um, animal meat, and saw, dropped an LDL cholesterol, boom, right? So even though there's saturated fat and Beyond Meat, there's less than regular, right? Um, uh, dropping TMAO, which is toxic metabolite produced by our intestine when we eat animal flesh, but uh, no, no change in blood pressure. Like, how can you do a plant-based intervention and get no change in blood pressure? Uh, the heat and sodium the same, right? So we didn't get maximize the benefit. Um, and so to maximize, um, we really should try to try to cut down sodium intake. Ideally, 1,500 milligrams a day. Hard to do unless you are avoiding a lot of processed foods. But these salt substitutes, you like salt to taste, no problem. Get all the salt to taste you want, just get any of uh, potassium based salt substitute, as long as you have good kidney function to get rid of any excess. I hear a lot about kombucha gut health, but I yep. feel like you're maybe anti kombucha. I am anti kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> I am, uh, the science is anti kombucha. I am really right. conduit. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against it. No animals were killed in the making of that kombucha. I'm 100% down. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. The question was another one on the topic of sodium. Um, so I, a triathlete, and she's like endurance, athletics, and you know, Ironman, and triathlon type thing. You know, a big part of the nutrition for that is sodium intake. And also, when you're hydrated, like, you don't want to dilute your system. Of hydration isn't just intake of water, it's also like balance that. So I'm just kind of like, uh, kind right, of right. Yeah. are you saying that vegetables and other plant products have a, enough sodium without even like seasoning them? Or are you That's saying. Correct. Okay, it does. Gets it from the ground enough, even for the triathlete. So there is a there. There's a big sports energy drink industry, like yeah. the Gatorade mm -hmm. Institute, and they fund all these studies. But you check out my website and look up Gatorade or sports drinks, you can see that the science is not based on the foundation, that, and that they're just selling people salty sugar water for and making a lot of money, and that that is <laughs> unnecessary, even for those who are sweat migrants. So check out on that yeah. video if you. And, and so you said you said the yeah, the sodium chloride, like, is it potassium chloride or something so, like that? Yeah, potassium. And does that have have the same like? Is it only just a replacement that just doesn't have the negative impacts of 
So you have or does it also have the Ooh. positive impact of Ooh, food? Ooh, that's a fantastic <laughs> question. Then we got some high level nutrition experts here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, indeed, so there are actually benefits to potassium. So 97% of Americans don't get enough fiber, even when you should recommend a minimum daily intake. So when people say, where are you getting protein? Where do you get your fiber? That's <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. this. 97% of Americans deficient in fiber, only fiber concentrate in all the plant foods. Okay, but 98% of Americans, the one thing even more people are deficient in is potassium. Don't even reach the recommended minimum of 4,700 milligrams a day. So when you more potassium, less sodium, hey, what about using a potassium chloride instead? So yeah, it does have that additional benefit. What are negative yeah, impacts yeah. of not having enough potassium? Normally, uh, blood pressure regulation. Okay. Um, oh. So and so, okay. even potassium rich foods, even if you keep your sodium level the same, um, you can lower your blood pressure. And the healthy sources are beans mm -hmm. and sweet potatoes and greens. Yes. I found the the protein restriction stuff really interesting. How robust would you say is the the research behind it? The longevity research in nutrition it really centers around protein restriction, particularly methionine restriction. And boy, did we luck out that the absolute most concentrated source of methionine fish, worst, because it's most concentrated, right, and then down poultry, dairy, and then finally all the plant protein sources. So that's considered one of the kind of hypotheses of why those we plant based diets live so much longer is because they're restricting their methionine. And that's partially because they may be eating less protein overall, so getting it that way, and then eating, um, you know, uh, lower kind of methionine sources. It's only controversial in the world. It's not controversial in the literature. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what about if iodine is your main source oh. of salt? Nice. Oh, that's a fantastic question. Right. So, iodine, critical trace mineral. People weren't getting enough and having scoiters and all sorts of problems. Um, like cretinism, with, with the birth defects, from uh, mothers not getting enough um, iodine. So they said, okay. We have to put it in something in the, in the food supply. Everybody eats salt, so let's iodize the salt. Um, and all of a sudden, these epidemics of horrible diseases went away. Fantastic. Of course, uh, they put it in like the wrong place, right? It's like, <laughs> oh, everyone drinks milk, so let's put vitamin D in milk, and then everyone won't get rickets anymore. Okay. So that was kind of like a convenient way to, to, to get our iodine. And if we're not eating salt, which we really shouldn't be, if you do use salt, please don't. But if you do use salt, <laughs> use iodine salt. You gotta get your iodine. Iodine's found in the soil and taken up by plants. So there's a little bit of iodine based on plant foods, but you never know, unless you're growing your own food, like where the soil was. So maybe there was just kind of iodine deficient soil and you don't know, you're eating all this food and you're not getting too much iodine. The most concentrated, healthy sources are sea vegetables. Um, and so like nori, like the sheets of seaweed, nori, so you can snack on them. So two sheets a day get all the, the iodine. Um, uh, or even more concentrated sources, there's a, there's a seaweed called dulse. It's a pretty purple seaweed. You can get flaked or powdered dulse and you sprinkle it on food. I have videos about it, all the dosing. Well, I think it's like half a teaspoon. It's really a little bit. So you can mix that with your nutritional yeast or bread. Like whatever you put on food, mix it with your flax seeds or your wheat germ, whatever you sprinkle on foods. Um, let's throw in uh, one of the little dulse. The reason I mentioned those two is they're kind of the unseaweedest, seaweedest seaweed. <laughs> there are a lot of stronger seaweeds, um, uh, but if you don't like the seaweed taste, those are relatively mild. Um, RMA is really, it's like, a, forms like noodles. It's like these thin threads, and so it's great for soup. So you like eating noodles, and also very kind of mild flavor. So I encourage people to kind of like, hey, let's get some sea vegetables in our diet somehow, even if it's just kind of sprinkling on whatever. I'm snacking on more or... Avocado sushi. Avocado sushi, there we go. Um, yeah, yeah, so, uh, but I'm so glad you bring it up. So there was a study, so if you type in vegan iodine, so a study in Boston found that uh, pregnant vegans were actually, and you can measure the amount of iodine in your urine to get a sense of body levels, and they're actually um, among the lowest in the population. So we want to, particularly during pregnancy, make sure we're getting a, a good source of iodine. What is your take on white sugar, and how does it compare to coconut sugar, agave, and Oh, fantastic. So what about, you know, just like white sugar compared to like cane sugar, or raw sugar, or turbinado sugar, or, you know, all these coconut, coconut sugar, or, or agave, or dead sugar, 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 <laughs> sugar. So there's really only kind of two nutritive sweeteners, meaning sweeteners that for all those calories, you actually get some nutrition back. 
Uh, but one is blackstrap molasses. Uh, but you like the blackstrap molasses. Um, you know, you can you can put that in. I mean, certain foods that, that taste good in body. And the other one is um, so-called date sugar, which is not sugar. It's the one sugar that isn't actually sugar. It's just dried, pulverized dates. So it's a whole food. They just take dates, dry them, and they pulverize them in the powder, and call that date sugar. And so you're just sprinkling dates. You're sprinkling the whole food. You can also um, get date syrup. But what you want to do is try to get date syrup with the highest fiber content. So you can find date syrup with two, two grams of fiber, that would be the minimum. Because otherwise, the date syrup is really, they just, it's really much more processed than, than, than we'd like. So here you can make your own date syrup at home, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, so date syrup would probably be kind of the healthiest to, to, to bake with, because you're baking with a whole food. So do you not eat sugar? Um, so I encourage people to get all their macronutrients, their carbs, their protein and fat, from ideally from whole food sources. So there's nothing wrong with fat, just get them from avocados and nuts and seeds and nuts and seed butters. Nothing wrong with sugar as long as you get it from fruit and sweet potatoes, right? Um, and there's a little problem with protein, but we can, you know, moderate our amount of protein and get it from healthier sources. Yes. Me? Yes. Uh, so what about like balsamic glaze as a sweetener? Because that's a vinegar that's been just. What? Oh, balsamic oh, balsamic. Glaze. Oh, well, see now balsamic. Yeah, now you're cheating. Because, <laughs> because, balsamic, because vinegar is super healthy because of the acetic acid. So vinegar is the definition of vinegar is acetic acid in water, mm -hmm. um, and acetic acid has all these miraculous benefits. So if you, if instead, instead of autophagy, I talk about AMPK activation, you would all be talking about how we gotta eat vinegar every day. Mm -hmm. And so, what a great way. So I did, it's on that oatmeal, I'm putting chocolate balsamic on my oatmeal because mm -hmm. we wanna get, yeah, vinegar in, and so it has all sorts of other benefits. And so, um, there's all these flavored vinegars, there's savory vinegars like, you know, barbecue, mm -hmm. hickory smoke, mm -hmm. there's like, you know, or like blackberry ginger and you can like make, and so it's great flavoring and you're adding that acetic acid. So mm -hmm. in that case, um, the acetic acid, the benefits really outweigh the, the um, sugar content. Cool. Yes. Um, is there any risk to uh, eggs being uh, um, extra B12 supplementation? Oh, with B12 injections, you can get a, a high enough surge that you can just break out in acne. There's no reason anyone needs to get uh, injections of B12. The reason doctors tell you to get injections of B12, because they get paid for it. Mm -hmm. You actually have to go to the doctor and they get paid for putting an injection in your arm. It's really cool stuff. It's ruby red because of the cobalt. So it looks like this mad scientist. It's very cool stuff. <laughs> but, yeah, and so it has this like great placebo effect. Ooh, I'm getting like a boost. <laughs> but uh, no other country does it. We have a for-profit healthcare system. No other country injects people. They just give people B12 supplements. Presumably if you took enough B12 supplements, like we chug down the bottle, I mean, break out an active. There's actually these bugs that that um, cause acne on your skin that kind of live off, that, that use B12 as critical cofactor. When they get a lot of B12, they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, but at regular, so, but at taking regular doses, there aren't any cases. So I do have a, a video talking about, you know, uh, acne and B12, you can check it out in the video. But mm -hmm. other than that, it's water soluble, but just kind of pee out, the, pee out the excess. All right, so salt, uh, under, uh, it's my understanding it. Uh, Pretty please, french fries! <laughs> <laughs> Like if you if you remove it from your diet, yeah. essentially you get you retain more calcium, so your calcium needs to go down. Is that true? So yeah, one of the problems with salt is it causes uh, you lose calcium in your urine, um, and so that's why uh, the, the high salt intake is associated with osteoporosis. And so you're saying if you stop eating salt, you'll well, it's hard to get 1,400 milligrams of calcium, you know, and, and so you'll retain, so you, well, you had, so it's only, it's like a 10% effect, so it wouldn't really okay. matter much, okay. it really didn't, but we do want to get 600 milligrams of okay. calcium a day, ideally from whole foods, best dark green leafy vegetables, low oxalate dark green leafy vegetables, that's all green leafy vegetables except spinach, um, Swiss chard, and beet greens, which are fantastic foods, but just stingy with their calcium. Um, and so, you know, eating any of the greens, every day, that's really the best source because all the wonderful things that come with it. Uh, but we really do want to hit 600. It's like when you, you may hear that, like, I don't need to worry about calcium. Well, you don't need to worry about it because you're getting 600 a day. And if you're not, then you're going to be a vegan in the Oxford Vegetarian Study mm -hmm. and have higher bone fracture risk because of it. What about pink salt? And can you over salt green? Oh. You're like killing me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, pink salt is salt, except it's pink. <laughs> <laughs> and Himalayan pink sea salt is still salt, it's just Himalayan and pink. Why don't you call on a muck? Kalamamak? I don't even know what that is. The black, oh, black salt that oh, with the eggy. Oh, oh the sulfur in it. Oh, yeah. 
I don't know if you could use small enough amounts to get the eggy flavor without the without getting exceeding 1500 milligrams a day, but yeah, it's still salt. I mean, yeah, too bad we can't get the sulfur without it anyway. Um, oh, and can we saute our greens in oil? Well, uh, or can they, if you saute them too much, do you lose Oh, benefits? if you saute too much, do you lose benefits? And um, the answer is, so fried grain, so frying grains really does knock out. Um, but um, so I prefer um, kind of water sauteing, a broth sauteing, or wine sauteing, where the the heat doesn't raise that high because the, the heat's you know used up by the water and produces steam. So it never really reaches those kind of high frying heat temperatures that really does uh, hurt uh, hurt those um, some of those compounds. Um, and so I encourage people again, you know, to get their fat from whole food sources. So and but uh, critically important. So glad to bring it up. The um, the, the greens pigments I'm talking about are like lutein, zinc, anything so important for vision, so many things, they're fat soluble. So if you eat your greens, you eat a salad with like a oil free dressing, you're not gonna absorb it. You're just gonna poop it out and get no benefit. So you have to have some nuts with your with your stir fry, with your greens, you have to have you know some nuts in your pesto or whatever you do with greens, make sure in your stomach at the same meal, there's some avocado or some peanut butter or whatever. Tahini. You wanna have fat with it. Um, yeah. Awesome. Oh, these are great questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Me? Yes. Yay. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to get more greens, and I've uh, heard greens. Uh, more greens. Greens. Uh, greens. Greens. So, um, <laughs> um, I'm wondering, can I put it in a smoothie? Because that's such an easy way when we get frozen spinach or kale, can I still get the same benefit? Not only do you get you get three times more benefits, right? The availability is triple. So it like doubles when you mince it, as opposed to eating whole leaf spinach, where you're just using your teeth to chew it. If you mince it before you eat it, you get twice the amount absorbed to your bloodstream, um, and you lose the rest. Um, and then you get triple the bioavailability if you actually blend it up. So, if you're like, oh, I eat smoothies, well, pesto, I mean, there's all sorts of, there's like Indian dishes with like, you know, uh, blended greens. There's all sorts of ways to get greens to blend in your greens. But yeah, that really does. I mean, you can never really chew that good. I mean, you don't have to blend if you really, really chew, but no one really chews that well. Um, but yeah, it's all in releasing those, the, releasing that nutrition from the cell walls. Okay, so. Hi, so what do you think about supplementing with NMN or resveratrol? Oh, wow, high level. We're talking high level. <laughs> okay, so I have a whole chapter on NAD. Anyone's familiar with the longevity literature, there's lots of buzz about these classic, classic NAD boosting supplements. There are eight of them. I go through every single one of them. And the bottom line is it's people trying to sell you stuff. But there are two ways we can naturally boost NAD or with that and exercise. It is actually able to raise um, levels in the tissues, which none of the supplements have ever been shown to do because the body's way too smart to be mucked around with. Eat a vegan diet and exercise. That's the bottom line. That's the spoiler alert for NAD. I mean, resveratrol, which is like the red wine compound, was found to triple the loss of brain tissue over time. So if you want your brain to shrink, if you're like, I've got too much brain, <laughs> I want a smaller brain, then take resveratrol. Otherwise, don't do it. Yeah, so you were paying for a smaller brain. You're like, please, take my money. Triple brain shrinkage over time. Can I decide so why would David part? Sinclair? Why would David Sinclair tell me? Maybe because he was on the board of a resveratrol company <laughs> selling this stuff. Okay. I I have a lot of respect for David Sinclair, but I tell you, when money comes involved, mm -hmm. very smart yeah. people mm -hmm. say not so smart things. Yes, I find the exact same thing. So if you didn't hear the question, it's like, well, at home, when I have control of my diet, boy, I mean, super healthy, right? Mm -hmm. But on the road, it's not so easy. Like. You think being vegan on the road is hard, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Eating healthy on the road? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, you know, there's oatmeal and all Starbucks, like all this kind of typical thing. You can go food, you can get, um, uh, uh, I see Kai's whipping out his. So anybody? This is uh, on the Daily Dozen. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Kai Bowen started a uh, plant-based, um, a whole food plant-based food company. Um, where it's basically dehydrated berries and greens and blah, blah, blah. Uh, oh. Oh, you want to? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll just get a hold in front of the camera. Hold in front of the camera. There it is. I feel like I'm doing a commercial. I get no money. I get no money from, from his company. But I mean, the whole point was he's like, we need to make 
healthy and convenient, so it's really light, so I can put it in my in my in my suitcase and walk around. I actually, this is this is funny. So I'm I'm going. I'm heading off to the airport now. What do I have in my bag? What? I mean, what? No, here we go. Microwave sweet potato. Uh, I got it. This is the. Yeah, there's, yes. a, there's a microwave down by the fitness center. BYOSP. <laughs> when you sit next to somebody you <laughs> anyway um, uh, but I mean so there's a, like there's a lot of uh, like uh, you know uh, like kale chips and things that are really light easy to get to oh can't get that through security they always think that you gotta take it out put it next to the bag <laughs> yeah. so is the company Leafside? oh Leafside it yeah. is Leafside yeah so and the website is Go leaf side. Go leaf side. Okay. That's great. All right. Yeah. Uh, similar to the David Sinclair question, I think doesn't yeah. he tout them taking metformin for longevity? Oh, yeah. And is it similar with the resveratrol? Oh yeah. So um, there's a couple of drugs um, mm -hmm. uh, like rapamycin and mm -hmm. metformin. Um, oh, this is a super fascinating story, um, but just not to. to and so I have chapters on each, cool. and just don't do it. Um, uh, but super fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, yeah. The, yeah. It turns out, and I thought I may end up on the other side of that, but the back science is clear. Yeah. So I had been diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease, mm, yeah. hypothyroidism, a couple years ago, and it's since stabilized with medication. But there's some people online that have talked about how you could address it through diet, but you have to like test your blood and it could like waver. And I'm wondering like what you think about like if there's evidence that you can treat it without medication, with right. diet alone, if you think that's like advisable, and if you are taking the medication, if there's still things that you should be doing regardless to treat the disease, even if ah. your thyroid level is not. Yeah, fantastic sure. question. So Hashimoto's is an autoimmune um, disease where your body attacks your own thyroid, kind of scars it up, thyroid gland makes the thyroid hormone, and you need thyroid hormone. And so by medication, you're not really taking medication. I'd like you to think about it as you're really doing hormone replacement therapy. You're just, literally, the drug is just hormone therapy, human hormone therapy, uh, human thyroid hormone, and so you're just bringing your levels up to natural levels, right? And so um, it's not like it's some kind of synthetic compound that's doing something crazy in your body. I mean, it's just like bringing your, like, you, sh you should be here, you went down here, and I just bring you back up because your body isn't making you up. Unfortunately, it's because it's scarred up at that point, um, uh, the, I mean, once your levels fall because of it, um, you don't kind of unscar, um, but you can um, reduce your risk of getting either hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism by eating a vegan diet. It's V E G A N. Uh, no, so the Adventist 2 study found that, that vegans were significantly more likely to uh, be so called new thyroid, or have a healthy thyroid function. Um, and the thing is, because these are like inflammatory conditions and you're eating an inflammatory diet, it may help prevent these. But once you already have it, you will unfortunately um, probably be on thyroid hormone replacement therapy for the rest of your life. And thank God you have some condition that's so easily treatable and it doesn't have side, like it's just like, ah, if, we, if all diseases could just be like, oh, I'll just, I'm doing this, I'll go back to this, so yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with the work of Dr. Brooke Oh, Brooke, Brooke yes. Oldner, yeah. Yeah, speaking, she is, she is the queen of green smoothies. <laughs> so you recommend oh, she's, following yeah. her? Uh, so yeah, she, she, so she, uh, she deals with a lot of uh, really serious autoimmune conditions like lupus, um, where your body attacks, uh, attacks, hmm, I'm gonna attack DNA. That's not a good thing to attack. <laughs> and so it can cause, as you can imagine, all sorts of uh, really serious problems. And so she has a really intensive regimen where like I thought I was eating greens. No, this is like massive amounts of green smooth, like uh, blended greens and, and flax seeds by like the three quarter cup. Like, oh, right. A very intense, I'm trying to really cool down inflammation in a heat flare of some kind of horrible um, inflammatory disease. And she's had uh, quite success in published some case series. I'm um, seeing some kind of remarkable benefits. It's not something to kind of do day to day. I mean, we shouldn't need that kind of, but in terms of a, uh, if there's some kind of serious, you know, inflammatory insult, in addition to whatever else you might be doing, your doctor may be telling you to do, you can also make these drastic changes from diet temporarily to eat lots of anti-inflammatory foods and then try to tamp it down. Uh, do you have to cut carbs to lose weight? You do not have to <laughs> cut carbs to lose weight. You do have to um, uh, cut at least your absorption of calories, and you do that by eating 
Primarily, so I wrote a book, How Not to, eat, to Diet. The easiest method is think about caloric density. And so you eat foods that have low number of calories per unit volume, per cup, per mouthful. And so those are, you know, all kinds of health plant foods. Vegetables have the least. Like, you literally impossible to, you don't have to eat like, you know, wheelbarrows full of spinach to even maintain your caloric intake. There's just no way you, you couldn't chew that much. And two pints of strawberry ice cream, that's 2,000 calories. That's what calorie needs for the day. But if you ate 2,000 calories of strawberries, I think it's like 40 cups of strawberries, four zero mm -hmm. cups. They like couldn't fit 40 cups of strawberries in your stomach if you wanted to. Like, and so by shifting to more kind of calorically dilute foods, then you can eat more and actually um, lose weight and get all the actual nutrition. Yes. What about like food? herbs and spices you can do to lower cholesterol, so you don't have to take love statins. It, love it, okay. So um, so just just by cutting out the three things that raise your cholesterol, which is saturated fat, um, trans fat, and dietary cholesterol, found concentrated eggs, junk food, meat, dairy, um, the average vegan, boom, um, 68, LDL 68, exactly what we wanted. We want under 70 for primary prevention. Um, if you already had heart disease, we want to even lower, but um, if you haven't had a heart attack yet, Perfect, nailed it, but it's a bell curve, right? So some people go vegan, they do even better, and some are still stuck up because of the genetics, stuck, stuck higher than, and so what can we do? So then the next step is to add food storage diet that actively pull cholesterol from our system, a system called portfolio diet, um, uh, which was made by Dr. David Jenkins, University of Toronto, he developed the glycidic index, world renowned um, researcher, vegan, so it's a strictly plant-based diet, but adding, you know, uh, soluble fiber rich foods like slimy foods like okra, oatmeal, and eggplant that pull cholesterol out. And then different foods, so the portfolio of different foods. So I'd add those, and then there's all these cool spices that in tiny amounts, like the black cumin can significantly lower amla, this dried Indian gooseberry powder. Um, and they're not really supplements, right? It's just, these are just dried fruits or dried seeds or whatever. Um, and so if you just type in cholesterol and nutrition facts, then those will all come up. Um, and so yeah, I do all sorts of crazy, Crazy spices every day. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, when you uh, talk about the negative um, impact of having berries with milk, oh, yeah. not, what kind of milk are you talking about? Oh, I am so sorry. Cow's milk. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So dairy milk. Right. Yeah, isn't it, isn't it wonderful that we arrived at a yeah. time where you have to yeah. specify, oh no, talking about cows milk. <laughs> like from a, like from a, like udders? What? Really? Yeah, you don't have that biodiversity problem with uh, soy milk. Um, and it's never been tested for other plant milks, but other plant milks are so low in protein you would not expect, because there's a protein interaction between the casein and milk, mm -hmm. in, in dairy milk, um, which binds up these polyphenols, so you can't absorb it. Um, and so, interestingly, the soy protein binds it up in the small intestine, but then delivers it to the lower intestine where it's broken off and we actually absorb it. Um, and so, it's, since it's a protein thing, there's really not a lot of protein in other plant milks, we, I wouldn't expect um, it to be an issue. Can you be a healthy vegan with T1D and not like bolusing all day long for all of the beans and yeah? What? <laughs> where is my Where is my star? Where is my type one diabetes star? Oh yeah. Oh, she Great. didn't even Great. come to my Q and A session. <laughs> um, uh, maybe she's she's watching whatever we're missing. But um, uh, so no, so you you are in the presence. In this very hotel, she was sitting up front, um, with uh, Breeze Tompkinson, who's a type 1 diabetic, who has non-diabetic blood sugar. She has the best team of globin A1C you've ever seen in your life as a measure of long-term blood sugar control. And she is happy to counsel um, people to maintain better blood sugars than everybody else around you. So you absolutely can have beautiful um, blood sugars, and she can tell you how to do it. Is she accessible through vegan outreach, or how? Oh, oh, oh! She's the accountant of vegan outreach. How cool is that? Oh, oh, um, uh, uh, what's the best way to reach her? She really needs to like do a website. Google, Google, Google. Oh, so her name is B R E E G E Tomkinson. I'm sure there's like yeah, vegan outreach. Like yeah, could I talk to your accountant? <laughs> <laughs> so a few months back you posted about the ability of ground ginger just three times a day oh. to reduce menstrual flow yeah, and yeah. thank you game change. <laughs> 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 
it just inflammation or how Isn't does that work? Isn't it wild? Work? It's wild. So, yeah. So, it's an inflammatory mechanism. An anti-inflammatory mechanism mm -hmm. has this vasoconstrictive effect on the on the uh, arteries. And so, it's the, basically the same mechanism you get from kind of ibuprofen, but it works without kind of the side effects. Um, although, it's not clear whether it works for fresh ginger or not. There's these dehydration products of, of ginger oil, which is kind of primary component. It turns into shojils, which is like Japanese for ginger. Um, a totally different compound, only when it's dry. And actually, the surgery it hasn't been tested for uh, menstrual pain or flow, but has been tested for other things, whereas the fresh ginger did not work, but the dried ginger did. Mm -hmm. And the studies that were done, menstrual studies, were all done with dried ginger. So I'd stick with dried ginger as opposed to like, whoa, why not I just do it this way? So yeah. Oh, great. And it's not a lot, right? It's, it's not a lot at It's all. crazy. Eighth of a teaspoon. Eighth of, on a, on my eighth of a teaspoon. Mm -hmm. Sweet. I love it. Oh, I love like hearing stories of like, actual on the ground, I did this, I feel better, and now My I'm gonna go save animals all day long. <laughs> <laughs> leptin or not to leptin, what is the deal? Oh, yeah. What? Come on. So there's a, there's a fellow named Dr. Gundry who wrote a book <laughs> called... Plant well, Paradox. Oh, Plant Paradox, yeah, it's mine. Um, so anyway, so but they, my video is not subtle, it's called <laughs> Dr. Gundry's Wrong. I think it's... <laughs> Normally, I like to kind of coach things and like, well, let's look at no. It's the of course, so many of these things are kind of based on the culture, like the whole low carb thing. Well, of course, your fine carb garbage is bad, and so you'd be like, oh, so all carbs are bad. What? Okay. Um, so same thing. So the, like, so you cannot eat. You can't eat raw beans. Of course, you can't eat raw beans because they're hard and break your tooth. But if you take red kidney beans, for example, and you soak them long enough. Um, they, they're still hard and rubbery and really inedible, inedible, but you could actually chew them, and if you did, you would be violently sick because there are lectins in these beans that prevent them from being eaten by herbivores, but we figured about cooking them. So cooking utterly destroys the lectins. If you can eat the bean, the lectins are gone. So there's no lectins in cooked beans, either in a can or anywhere. Um, as soon as it's mushable by a fork, the lectins are gone. Tomatoes. And sprouting. Uh, and there's a lot of things like lentils you can eat, sprouted, totally fine. You still don't want to, yeah, red kidney beans have a lot of, you'll get really sick. So yes, there are these lectins, but they're destroyed by cooking, or they're completely harmless, like they're lectins of raw tomatoes, but they're utterly harmless. In fact, there's some lectins that are actually good for you, makes it beneficial. It's no paradox. <laughs> <laughs> but it sells books. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so my dad has severe Crohn's disease. Ugh. His diet is just like crap fast food type of food because he has legitimate scar tissue. Yeah. His knowledge on nutrition is really like lacking and outdated. Yeah. And so it's really hard. Like he was moved by environmental reasons oh. for veganism. Nice. But it's really hard to know like are there plant foods that he could oh. digest and that would perhaps even help his scar tissue because he seems to think that only the very process. Got it. No, no, that that's a fantastic question. There's only one dietary intervention ever been shown to significantly improve Crohn's, improve uh, remission, maintain pupil remission, and that is a plant based diet. So if you go to Crohn's on nutrition facts that over pull up those things, you can show them. That is the single most powerful thing we can do. And rivals um, these horrible drugs that put people on for both ulcerative crisis and Crohn's, the two inflammatory bowel diseases. But if you've had Crohn's for a while, you actually develop these strictures. You get your, your intestine gets scarred up and so narrowed. Um, and so if you just like ate a kale salad or something, poor, this poor dude, God forbid, um, he could actually get an intestinal obstruction. Yeah. And, and he would end up in the hospital and they have to cut you open and very, very serious. In fact, oh God, we have a vegan leader in the movement um, with Crohn's who followed my advice, ate a lot of kale, um, uh, and, and ran into problems. People, they eat a lot of junk food because there's no fiber in junk food. So right. basically by the time it gets down to the intestines, there's nothing left, it's all been absorbed. So that's why it's really just about, uh, you know, blending. Um, so, so he could eat green smoothies every day, and that would have this tremendous anti-inflammatory effect. But he, he's absolutely right in that he shouldn't be, you know, just like having big gulps of raw broccoli without chewing really well, because he can run into it. Yes. Um, my dad has high cholesterol, but he does have a whole food plant-based diet. Oh. Yeah. Um, and so he's eating like a lot of plant-based foods, but he's not eating 
I'm wondering in that in that case, like if you already are subscribed yeah. and you're doing that, is that in just like a, the best that you can do? Oh, well, so the, so yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So here we have someone who's not only eating vegan, but sounds like eating a healthy plant-based diet, still cholesterol too high. So as I mentioned, the portfolio diet would be the first step, adding these cholesterol lowering foods to your diet. Um, and all the spices, blah, 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 that I talk about on nutritionfacts.org. So I just go put in cholesterol and add that to the diet. And if it still doesn't reach the level, then you go to this uh, cardiovascular disease uh, risk um, scale, which I have a video about. There's three of them. And you type in, you find out what your 10 year uh, risk of an event, a cardiovascular event is, based on your blood pressure and your cholesterol and your age. And if it's hits a certain level and there's nothing else and you maxed everything else out, then indeed I would put uh, I would put him on a statin. If it still didn't work, I'd put him on a higher dose statin. If it still didn't work, I'd put him on a CKS9 inhibitor. If it still didn't work, I'd see. We have to get your cholesterol low because it's the leading risk factor for the number one killer of men and women. The most likely reason <laughs> All, the, all of our loved ones who aren't eating this way are going to die. It's from heart disease. And so we need to get mm -hmm. cholesterol down. And that should be done slam dunk, uh, typically, or at least on average, with a vegan diet. But if you're still lagging up there, it's not like, oh, well, I'm eating so healthy. It doesn't matter. I have high cholesterol. No, it matters. Um, and so, you know, and the same thing with like something like colonoscopy. I don't recommend colonoscopy, but I do recommend colon cancer screening. There are non-invasive ways. You say, like, colon cancer? Like, I'm like the lowest risk. I'm not, I don't have to get colon cancer screen. I'm vegan. I'm in the, no, you know what? <laughs> you, you of all people need to be screened for colon cancer starting at age 45. It's because you are the rare individual that's actually going to live a long life. <laughs> the reason they stop screening at age 70 is because they're like, you're going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, right? But colon cancer is so amazing that you, you can see it growing the lining and you can pull it off and then it's gone. Um, but once it kind of infiltrates into the into the body, you, you're basically told. So the, you may have this tremendous extension of life where you would have lived 20 years, but no, because of colon cancer, you didn't. And so they're like, well, there's no, you know. So so for people that are going to live long lives, it's even more important, important mm -hmm. to get uh, colorectal cancer screened because even though yes, our colorectal cancer risk is significantly lower, um, any risk, you know, just because it's lower. You know, it's like wearing a seatbelt. There's no guarantee it's not going to die in car crash. But the reason we put a seatbelt on is not for the guarantee, but it's because it's going to lower our risk. We have good science to back it up. Oh. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. I'm rewarding the squeaking wheel. What does the screening do? So there are five different accepted colorectal cancer screening technologies. Uh, from the USPSDF, the official body that determines. A few are invasive, like colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, and few are non-invasive, like there's a colon cancer DNA test where you send them, you, you, you get a little box in the mail, and you send back a stool sample, and they look to see if you have the DNA of colon cancer, and they tell you, boop, you don't have cancer. <laughs> funny story, I'll end with my funny story. So I turned 50 because they just changed it to, to 45, but I was all excited to get my first year. I got the box in the mail. <laughs> And so I did it, sent it back, and you know, waiting, and finally, they finally contacted me, they're like, we need to get you on the phone. Oh. I was like, shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, it, if it was just like negative, they'd just like email me. But like, they want to like talk me off a cliff or something. They want to like counsel me. So they get me on the phone. They're like, sorry, it was too large a sample. <laughs> dilutes the agents or whatever, oh and then you have to, have to send a second. <laughs> I did, they just weren't, they weren't doing for the beam and oh 